First District Court of Appeals now in session. All who have business before this court draw near, give attention, and you shall be heard. May God save these United States, the great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome to the First District Court of Appeal. We have two cases on the docket. The first case is the Honorable Governor Ron DeSantis in the Executive Office of the Governor versus the Florida Center for Government Accountability Incorporated. Is the appellant ready to proceed? You may. If I may, Your Honor, I'd like to reserve three minutes of time for rebuttal. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. My name is Nathan Forrester, and I represent the defendants in this case, which I will refer to collectively as EOG. With me today as co-counsel is Nick Maros, Deputy General Counsel in the Executive Office of the Governor. In this case, EOG received three sizable multifaceted records requests from the plaintiff, FCGA, two days before the governor was to declare a state of emergency in view of the impending landfall of Hurricane Ian. At the time, EOG was already handling more than 150 pending records requests, and that number would balloon to more than 260 in the next couple of weeks. Notwithstanding these constraints, EOG was able to respond to all of two and much of the third record request within the next 24 days. But because EOG was not able to provide the remaining records by the time of the accelerated hearing in this case, a mere 35 days after FCGA had submitted its initial request, the circuit court ruled that EOG's response was not reasonable and therefore violated the Public Records Act. Given the circumstances faced by EOG in responding to FCGA's request, we believe this ruling was erroneous and should be reversed. Will you address some of the arguments in the Appley's brief that this is either a premature appeal because there's been no determination of the amount of the attorney's fees, and also their argument regarding their claim that you conceded that you, that the governor's office improperly redacted the records? I think the panel's familiar with the timing of the records request and the facts. Thank you. I'm not happy to, Your Honor. We do believe the court has jurisdiction because the circuit court's order is final. It has already entered a final order that mandates production, and it has ordered EOG to pay attorney's fees. It therefore basically granted all the relief FCGA sought, and no merits issues remain to be determined. And we cited in our opposition to FCGA's motion to dismiss a number of cases in which courts have treated orders that find violations of the Public Records Act as final appealable orders, even though the circuit court expressly retained jurisdiction to determine the amount of attorney's fees and costs. Has that part been wrapped up, or is that on appeal here, or where's the fees? That has not yet been wrapped up, Your Honor. As to the, your other question about whether this is moot because of the records redaction, the court's order actually covered more than that. I'll back up for a second. First, we didn't concede that the records were properly redacted. We just chose to go ahead and comply with the order to reverse the redaction. And the court's order found liability based on our simply not having produced the remaining records by the time of the hearing. It wasn't simply the records that were- The court's order wasn't based in any part that I noted, based on redaction of the records, or it was all based on timing. Yeah, as to all the remaining records, of which the redacted records were just some. And I would point out that in order for the reversal of the redactions to form a basis for the court's determination that we were unreasonable, it would be necessary to show that 
in our initial decision to have made those redactions, we acted unreasonably and in bad faith. Maybe the court didn't make, make that finding. I, I also know that the, the complaint didn't talk about the redactions, and which, which led me to wonder what value the complaint has in this case, because things seem to go to all this stuff that happened after the complaint was filed, um, including the redaction issue, and such that it would seem by reading the complaint, the issue here is, was the obligation on EOG to, to provide all the records within 18, 19 days? But that's sort of not where this stuff went. It talked about all this stuff that happened after the complaint was filed as forming the basis for giving relief under the complaint, which seemed odd to me. Am I off? Well, I, I, we would certainly say that the mere filing of the complaint wouldn't have by itself triggered an obligation to respond within a, a set number of days. The Public Records Act doesn't contain any such deadline. It uses deliberately flexible language to the requirements to respond at any reasonable time and in good faith. I, I think the circumstances that arise in some cases after the fact necessarily bear on that question of whether a response is reasonable. Uh, the, the complaint is still useful to your question in that it contains the records requests themselves and a, one of the circumstances that we do think bears significantly on the question of timeliness was simply the scope and complexity of those requests. These were not the, the, perhaps the typical kind of records request you will see in Public Records Act cases where you often the requester is seeking a discrete file or, or No, these were pretty complex records requests. They were requests regarding records to and from the governor of the state of Texas. There were records requests to and from private corporations extensive records requests over a two, three week period. So how does that, in your view, uh, affect the test of reasonableness? Are the courts at liberty to hold that the more complex the request, the more time a state agency has to respond? Uh, we, we do believe a, a, a court is, Your Honor. I, I, I believe that is inherent in the the, the reasonableness requirement that is, you know, built into the plain language of And so that. to make a reasonableness determination seems to be very fact-dependent, obviously. And this is somewhat of an unusual procedure in this case because you submitted um, a document that the trial court noted uh, it wasn't going to rule on whether it was admissible and it would sort of take it at face value. Is there a problem with the factual determinations here? Was there, should, have there, should there have been a more detailed evidentiary hearing? We do think the court erred in effectively skipping entirely the step of considering the circumstances that would bear unreasonableness, unre, un, unreasonableness and going directly to what it deemed to be a lack of evidence on our part concerning direct steps that we had taken to respond. So in other words, the way, the way the trial court characterized it is not that there were facts which would support the, the complaint that the office acted unreasonably, but that you failed to rebut uh, any indication, and that is the lack of evidence that led to the order. That's, that's correct, Your Honor, and we believe that improperly shifted the burden of proof from the plaintiff to the defendant. The, the ordinary rule in a civil action, of course, is that the plaintiff bears the burden of proof that nothing in the Public Records Act indicates. And that question hasn't really been answered by the courts, has it? Well, th this court this has... This specific question as to whether which party bears the burden of persuasion on proving reasonableness on a timeliness question. Uh, th this court has said in the 2010 case, Grapsky v. C City of Alachua, that the party making the claim under the Public Records Act has to prove, and they, they list four elements, that they made a specific request for the records, the agency received it, the requested public records exist, and the agency improperly refused to produce them in a timely manner. So we think this court has indicated that the, the, the plaintiff bears the burden there. Um, 
I, it, I get, I, I, there's no and the facts here really aren't in dispute as far as I can tell from the briefs. I, I Essentially, the, the demand was made on September 20th, I believe. Uh, Hurricane Ian hit September 22nd. Uh, the governor's office acknowledged the demand. You filled, fulfilled two of the three requests. You had sort of a rolling um, response to the first request, as I recall. But the facts here aren't in really in dispute. And as I recall, the final documentation was provided in, within 70 days. Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. There, there does remain an issue about uh, the, the cell phone records, which is, uh, is right now teed up in a contempt motion that FCGA has brought. That remains to be resolved. But other than that, yes, we responded fully. In, actually, this, case, actually within, in this case, there's a contempt motion? Yes, yes, Your Honor. We actually responded fully, I believe, would it be within 54 days, because that was the date the court directed us to respond by. Our estimate was that it would take us 70 days. And that actually leads to one of the things that concerned us about the precedent set by the court's order was that it effectively forced a reordering of priorities on our part. Uh, we. Uh, we think it, it, it basically allowed FCGA to jump its place in line ahead of other pending records requests that were that we had. And I'm sure the appellee will want to address this, but I noted the court order did not even mention Hurricane Ian, yeah. did not mention the other public records requests. The court circuit court order basically just said that um, you had to fulfill these demands quite promptly. That's correct, Your Honor. It, it simply skipped past the question of the circumstances bearing on reasonableness, which would then in turn bear on whether plaintiff had made out its prima facie case of it, a isn't, violation. Isn't the rule, though, that he said basically that if you've got a public records request that you're in violation unless you're making direct steps, and you started talking about direct steps a little bit earlier, unless you're making direct steps with the request, which I take to mean with all 245 that, I mean, if all 245 sue, your obligation is to make direct steps in all 245. So it's not necessarily an ordering. It's that everything has to be done now because of this direct steps language. Yeah, that's part Do of I get that right, or and is that the right rule? In the event all 245 were to sue, it, yeah, that, is, that is potentially an implication of the circuit court's order, which we, we do view to be as deeply problematic because then it, the, the court is effectively forcing a, 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 a reallocation of resources on the part of uh, the governor's office um, to the, at the expense of other statutory duties that the, the governor also bears. I see that my... Well, Time on is that, is that in a legislative, is there a legislative problem there? Because the, the statute seems to contemplate a single custodian of records or a designee, and it's all in the singular tense. It doesn't say designees or what have you. So it all needs to funnel, it seems, through a custodian. Um, am I, is that right? Or do you have the op option to have, you know, a 100-member public record shop and they're all designees who... Uh, yeah, I, I don't understand the statute to limit us in the number of staff. We, in fact, have two full-time staff <coughs> members, including the director of the Office of Open Government, who was um, identified by the governor's executive order as the governor's agent in charge of responding to public records requests. But is, that the, is, I'm sorry. I just, is that the custodian of records for purposes of statute in this case? Or is it the I, I believe the governor is officially the custodian of records for purposes of the statute, but the, the director of this office is the governor's agent and, and carries that out on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Going back to the separation of powers, and Madam Clerk, if you would, please grant the uh, appellant five additional minutes and the appellee five additional minutes. Going back to the separation of powers, the, the circuit court stated essentially that uh, the governor will do uh, as this order requires, and uh, the court's not going to concern itself with the cost or the implications, as that would touch on the separation of powers. I noted in your brief that you argue that that, in fact, did 
certainly implicate the separation of powers. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, it's a happy to, Your Honor. Um, I want to emphasize at the outset, we are in no way saying that an agency can altogether neglect its, its duties under the Public Records Act, but we are urging considerable caution about saying that an agency, especially one like exec the executive office of the governor, must, in response to a particularly onerous public records request, actually devote additional personnel and resources to, to deal with the request or to deal with a ramp up in the number of requests it has received for the separation of powers issues, reasons that you, you allude to. Uh, we, we think it would be ironic, um, uh, one might even say perverse, if an agency had to spend so much time and resources responding to records requests about how it is performing its essential functions that it uh, was forced to neglect those essential functions themselves. And there's a very risk, a very real risk of doing that here because all government agencies operate within the limits of their appropriations. Uh, I want to ask, to follow up on, on a question that uh, Judge Thomas had earlier. So I don't want to mischaracterize the, the Appley's argument, but it seems to me that they're claiming that some of the things that you've talked about, the hurricane, the, the number of public records requests that the governor's office get, constitute uh, local conditions which are improb uh, it's worth thinking of, um, uh, improper considerations for the reasonable uh, delay argument. Can you address that, please? Yeah, I, 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 I don't really believe they're properly characterized as local conditions within, within the understanding of the, the cases they cite. I mean, the, the, they, they are circumstances that clearly bear on the ability of an agency to respond. And, 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 and courts have considered extenuating circumstances. I would cite a, a recent fourth DCA case, um, Jackson v. City of South Bay, where the court did consider, among other, the, uh, among other facts, the, the existence of an intervening pandemic as bearing on the ability of the agency to respond in a timely manner there. Um, it's, it's, the, the, the case law, including case law in this court, the Siegmeister v. Johnson, the consumer rights case from 2015, which we cite in our brief, all, all are re replete with discussion about how circumstances matter in assessing reasonableness. And I, I don't, don't believe they can be dismissed as local in the sense that, that Apple is, is urging. Um, if your honors have no further questions, I will uh, Good afternoon. Hi, Andrew excuse, me. So, excuse me, Madam Clerk. So, Apley has five additional minutes, please. Thank you. Andrea Mogensen on behalf of Apley, the Florida Center for Government Accountability. Uh, if it pleases the court, uh, we do think that this court should affirm uh, the opinion of the trial court, not just because it comes clothed with the presumption of correctness but because there was a ruling in paragraph 10 of the court's order that improper redactions uh, were undertaken without, exempt, without an exemption being offered or proven. So in any event, the relief that's being sought by appellant here uh, would, would still apply because they violated the act by the improper redactions. Um, and that uh, was in the court's order, as I said, at paragraph 10 which is in the appendix at page 153. Was that part of the complaint, or how does that fit into the, how do we evaluate this case in light of the complaint? As I read the complaint and what happened there, the complaint may as well have been drafted at the same time as you made your request, because it just, that those first 18, 19 days that seemed to form the locus, they're not giving us, they're withholding records and refuse to give us records, is what the complaint said. And this case sort of spun off into this area of, well, they've given us stuff, but it's not what we want, and, and that kind of. Well, the, the issue that the sort of derives out of the complaint is, first of all, with regard to this uh, contention that there was a rolling production. The first production was non-responsive records from a completely different time period, 
And other than that production, there was no other production before the complaint was filed. Uh, the center in this circumstance uh, had to contend with Chapter 119, 07, sub 4, I'm sorry, 07, sub 1, sub H, which requires that when a requester contends that a record is a public record and an agency disputes that, there's only a duty to preserve that record if a complaint is filed within 30 days. If you do not file your complaint within 30 days, there's no further duty on behalf, statutory duty on the part of the agency to preserve that record, whereas here, the agency disputes that the records are public records. As the court knows, there is presently a contempt proceeding. Uh, it's in the supplemental appendix in the record on appeal, where the records to this day have not been produced as ordered by the court, at least from Appley's position, because the uh, agency disputes that the phone logs are public records. So had the center not filed within 30 days, there would be no opportunity for any judicial resolution of that issue. And of course, there's, it's the, the legislature has indicated what a reasonable time frame is to require an agency to retain a record uh, for such a dispute. So much has been made in appellant's briefing about the center's time frame and demands, but the truth is we're stuck with the same statutory framework. Uh, the legislature has indicated their belief of what a reasonable amount of time is before filing a complaint, because if you don't do it in that time, you don't get a judicial resolution on that issue. Well, that's a records retention oriented statute. Um, I guess what I'm interested in or more curious about is this complaint doesn't seem to track like where the facts went in this case. And um, they weren't limited to those first 18, 19 days where your claim I, it was, presumably was complete. They should have given us all this stuff within 18, 19 days. That was what the complaint said. I think it was um, 26 days, but yes. Yeah. Um, and there was no subsequent amended complaint to talk about, well, they've given us this stuff. And, you know, that, that it doesn't, didn't seem like that where the facts went were part of what was complained about. And I just wondered. Understood. Well, there was a motion for order to show cause, and a plaintiff sought mandamus relief in that motion for order to show cause and laid out a prima facie case for mandamus relief. The trial court made a ruling that, that the center had shown a prima facie case for mandamus relief and issued an order to the agency to show cause why the relief shouldn't be granted. And so frequently in public records cases, there are continued efforts, but the reality is uh, at the time of the hearing, Counsel for the agency conceded that the public records request had been received and conceded that they had still not been fulfilled at time of hearing. The burden is on the agency to show uh, that the delay was reasonable. And there has been, uh, the court asked my opponent if there has been a ruling on that. I believe there has. In Lilker versus Suwannee Valley, uh, this court held that the agency must produce a legally justifiable excuse for delay. Well, why didn't they do that? I mean, they, they said, uh, by way of this, this affidavit, I mean, they laid out what their case was. Essentially, they got 90 requests along the same line on top of 150 requests or whatever it was that were pending, and basically you can't throw a, you know, a, a hippopotamus through a strainer. I mean, you can't do it all at once. I don't think, uh, with due respect to both my opponent and the court, I don't think that those facts are properly considered here because the agency didn't put out any evidence of that. I mean, you can't proffer from counsel what your reasons are and expect to prevail in litigation. It was an evidentiary hearing. It's mandated to be an evidentiary hearing uh, by Chapter 119. And when you don't bring evidence to the hearing, you can't, you can't rely on those arguments in the trial court or on appeal. But, but the trial court reviewed that document presented by the governor's office and accepted it. I don't think it is in dispute that there was a major hurricane two days after your demand, as I recall, on the 22nd, that, in fact, last I checked, killed 39 people in the Fort Myers area alone, destroyed 19,000 houses. Uh, there were other public records requests. I mean, I think the argument, and I appreciate you addressing it, is that no party has a right to demand that their public records requests take precedence over other core functions of government, like attending to a major hurricane or other public records requests. So could you address, what, what is your entitlement exactly to a certain type of, you know, quick response? Well, the entitlement isn't unique to the center. 
No, it's, I understand. It's a no, I mean you, right, generically. I'm it's, sorry. It's a public entitlement. Right. It's Article One, Section 24 of the Florida Constitution, and which is specifically directed at each branch of government, including the executive branch. And it is an entitlement, and it's been held by the Florida Supreme Court, to be, able to be a public interest of the highest order. So it is a constitutional entitlement to immediate access, indeed. And, and I understand that, but logistically, what, I mean, the, the statute talks about a reasonable time. Again, no one's disputing that Hurricane Ian hit. Uh, your uh, client continued making demands during the hurricane, while the hurricane was devastating Florida. Uh, other public requests were previously filed before yours, right? Does your, does your, does any party have a right that their public records requests take precedence over core functions of government and other public records requests? Respectfully, the the records belong to the people. I understand that. There are records, and it is but a there public, were other records. It is a public interest of the highest order. Right, but there were other so, there were other I'm citizens trying. who made public records requests. Right. There was a major hurricane. They were providing some of the documents. So just help us articulate a rule that would uh, inure to your favor. Well, I think, and that's what I'm trying to do. I think that how the agency attends to its responsibility, it's a statutory responsibility under Chapter 119, it's a constitutional responsibility, and I, I, at the risk of repeating, it is a responsibility of the highest order. Public safety obviously also is, and a hurricane also is, but how an agency attends to that responsibility is outside of the reach of this court, and I think that's the, probably the only thing these parties agree on. But the fact that they do not properly attend to that does not result in the watering down of that responsibility. It results in loss in litigation such as this by any party, not the center specifically. And if an agency permits, according to them, which I think is inadmissible evidence, but if you accept what they say, that they've had that kind of a backlog for over two years and had failed to address it, that doesn't mean that the public's right to access uh, goes away. It means that they lose in litigation like this. You can't let 150 public records requests continue to be unfulfilled for two years. That's what they claim their circumstance was, and they specifically claim that the topic of this request had generated a recent 100 requests, so they knew the public very much wanted to know how their tax dollars were being spent and details about these events, and it's their constitutional and statutory responsibility to deliver those documents to the public in a timely fashion. We've been, the plaintiffs in this case have been characterized as you know, somehow being um, expecting greater treatment. But that's not our position. Our position is that the agency has a duty. It's a mandatory duty. It's not a discretionary duty to respond promptly uh, in good faith and to uh, respond in a reasonable amount of time. This and was your mandamus petition. What evidence did, did you put on to show that they acted in an unreasonable way in the way that they either elevated public safety over public records or because that's what their affidavit said, that, that partly what was going on, or that your request had some preference vis-a-vis um, -vis all the others, or I guess with this, the, the, the direct steps holding here uh, rule of this, of this order seems to be everybody has to be satisfied all at once, which doesn't seem like a reason. I don't know where that comes from in our case law um, and doesn't seem like that's very reasonable. Well, it comes from Canella in 1984, wherein the Florida Supreme Court said that the public disclosure of the content of all non-exempt records occurs at the moment that they become records. That the people are entitled to that on an immediate basis. And subsequently, in that case and subsequently, this court and the Florida Supreme Court have held that no reason for de delay is reasonable except the amount of time to verify that the records exist and to redact them. And if you look at how the facts played out in this case, the center made a public records request, received non-responsive records from a completely different time period, and nothing else until they filed suit. If plaintiffs don't file suit within the 30 days, which is required by the legislature, then they lose the opportunity. They lose an important right to litigate whether any record that the agency claims is not a public record is actually a public record. So, you know, the, the facts that were pled in the complaint that the court found to be a prima facie case was that a public records request was made and was unfulfilled.
But the court... So there's no question, there's no factual dispute that there was a delay. And that whether that delay is reasonable is an affirmative defense. Well, and the, the, court, the circuit court order didn't even mention the hurricane. It did not even mention Hurricane Ian. Not one word. It did not mention the other public records requests. So I, I think what at least I'm struggling with is in terms of the separation of powers, what, what is the rule that we can articulate that, is, that defines reasonable in, in this context? The public records requests made in this case regarding the, the uh, unauthorized aliens' flights was quite complex, at least according to my reading. Uh, it was not, please give me a copy of the contract entered into by XYZ. It was a multifaceted, multiple request demand. It was followed up by your client making additional requests during the hurricane. And again, no mention whatsoever by the circuit court of the circumstances regarding the delay, which according to opposing counsel, the, the records were provided within a total of 54 days. Now, maybe I misread the initial brief, I mean the initial brief, but the governor's office claims that the, some of the records were provided, like within 17 days. Is that not correct? Um, some records were provided, the, the records that were improperly redacted, but they were, they were the most simplistic things. They were <clears throat> the uh, alleged waivers that were improperly redacted and some photos. But I, with all due respect, I don't agree that this was a complex request at all because these are mostly electronic records that are easily uh, obtained by running a search of the pertinent documents. Were, I mean, to be honest, it was, it was a text log of a cell phone of somebody who works in their office. And they did not bring anyone to court to say, hey, we walked over to his office and asked if we could examine his cell phone to see if there were any, were any text responsive text on his log. The reason that the, sent, the agency didn't prevail here is that they didn't put on the proper evidence. Even if you accept, which we do not, we dispute, because the trial court did not admit the DiLorenzo um, uh, the document. declaration. Uh, they, it, was, it was excluded on relevance grounds. Because the trial court said, look, even if I accepted everything in here as fact, it's not relevant to the question at issue. If you look at the cases where reasonableness of, dis of delay has been resolved, every one of them goes over facts relating to the delay in responding to the requested issue. Did someone from the uh, governor's office come in and say, hey, look, we tried to find these, but we're going to have to send to Texas for them. Oh, we can't get into this computer. It crashed, so we don't know if we received any emails. Well, we looked counsel, at this text log. It's going to take us X number of hours and X amount of time, and these are the kind of things. They didn't, they didn't, issue, they didn't say a word about it. No word about how the hurricane impacted the actual the people who are responsi uh, responsible for public records, in what way were they removed? Were they removed from their duties during the hurricane? Were well, they thought, at home? Do I we thought know? the declaration said that the hurricane did affect the public records office. Right, but, but, but who was it? What happened? These are litigation is driven by facts, and when you're putting on an affirmative defense, you have to proffer if counsel isn't going to work. Declarations. But the aren't statute going to work. doesn't refer to the reasonableness test as an affirmative defense. Well, the courts do. The statute doesn't. Well, the statute requires that the records be produced promptly and reasonably. And so if, if there's a delay, then it would be an affirmative defense that our delay was reasonable. Because so what if you did, think but, about I'm it... I'm sorry, Judge Winokur, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. The, the appellant asserts a case, Grabsky versus City of Alachua, that, that states pretty clearly, I think, that the uh, requester has the burden of proving uh, that the agency improperly refused to provide the documents uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, is that case correct? Is it consistent with uh, Lilker, which you mentioned earlier? And is it consistent with your argument that the appellant simply failed to do all of these things and to prove all of these facts which would demonstrate uh, reasonableness? Uh, or was it, as Grabsky says, your obligation to demonstrate that it wasn't reasonable? Well, Grabsky involved a refusal. Okay, they said, we're not giving you these minutes until a month from now when they're approved at the next meeting. So there was an actual refusal. But that's what your complaint says, that you're 
That's what you alleged here. What we have is unlawful delay, which amounts to refusal. But that's not what you pled. That's not what you pled. It is. And, and it's, it's very similar. But the thing about Gramsci is that the court said you can't do that. You can't have a policy of delay. So th that case actually favors Appley's position because the decision to delay by 30 days in order to have them approved does not belong to the agency. The responsibility of the agency is to produce the records when requested and not to have a systemic delay. Can so it actually it's, it's more favorable to our position than to theirs. In this case, can you tell us again why the burden is on the governor's office to show the delay was reasonable? Because there's a statutory and presumption and uh, a statutory and constitutional presumption of openness right. because the plaintiffs pled a prima facie case and in order to show cause was issued directing the agency to show why the relief shouldn't be granted. But the statute refers to a reasonable time. So I'm struggling and I'm, I'm asking this uh, of both sides really. The statute refers to a reasonable time. Is it your burden or their burden regarding the test of reasonableness. It's their burden, but the reasonable time in the statute is to respond, but not to fulfill. The duty to fulfill is immediate, and the only permissible delay pursuant to the decisional law is to retrieve and redact. And courts have held, and we've cited them in our brief, and there are a bunch, that no other reason is acceptable, and that local conditions, uh, because we haven't staffed properly, because we haven't budgeted properly, do not excuse an agency from that duty. Um, the, the appellants here have offered no case that says, if, if our office is overburdened with requests, we're reasonable in delay. There, there is no such authority, and that's what's necessary here. Because so we, how, how would it, how, 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 let me ask you, so then in this particular case where I read your public records request, it, it is multifaceted, there were several requests, it was extensive. How just how quickly did they have to turn over all these records in your opinion? Twenty four hours, forty eight hours, I don't seventy two hours? I don't think that there's a bright line rule, but as noted, I mean there's this whole notion of there being a line. Well, our third request was fulfilled before the first request. I understand. So there is no line, but when things are readily accessible will help dictate what's reasonable. But again, how would a requester put on proof? of what's happening inside an agency as far as how these things are being responded to. You can't. You could say there was no hurricane. They have 87 people in their office. We got discovery. There are 50 of them who were on vacation that week, and they're not doing their job. I, I would guess that you could Well, the burden that. of proof, according to Lilker, is on the agency to show that the delay is reasonable. The burden of proof for an exemption is always on the agency. The, the, the statute, the public interest of the highest order, is giving the public access to the records on an immediate basis with an accelerated hearing available with preservation for 30 days the entire statutory framework contemplates immediacy in fulfilling public records this is a public interest of the highest order and it's a mandatory duty so while logistically they may have excuse legally they do not there's no legal justification for having a backlog of hundreds of cases over a course of years especially when 119 provides for that uh, in 119074D to charge requesters. And my client in this case invited the agency to charge us if there was an unreasonable burden on the agency, if it took extraordinary hours, extraordinary efforts. So there's no reason to say we don't have the resources for this because the legislature thought of that and they provided a remedy and, and okay, requester, you open your wallet if you need extraordinary resources the agency never requested a fee from this requester. Never indicated, hey, this is going to take us five or six hours. This is going to take, and they just randomly picked December 1st without any rationale. The agency needs a rationale for delay because they have a mandatory and non-discretionary duty to provide the records uh, to the requesters upon request, with the only delay being the amount of time it takes to gather that request. The, the statutory framework does not contemplate other requests. It doesn't contemplate a line. It doesn't contemplate delay. And the decisional case law has been pretty consistent on that, that the agencies have to show that their delay is reasonable. Well, I'm going to ask you to sum up. Okay. Um, 
see, the primary points I wanted to hit included those. Um, also, that um, I, we don't think that the council, facts. Council, I've allocated five additional minutes per side. You're now a minute and a half over the oh, five over. additional minutes. That's oh. okay. Well, I'm just going to ask you to say. briefly conclude. It's all right. Very good. Just I briefly I had, conclude. I didn't say I was in the red. I thought I had 130 left. Uh, then I will sum up by saying uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Council. And Madam Clerk, will you allocate an additional a minute 42 to the appellant, please? Or thereabouts. A, a couple of preliminary issues, Your Honor. Um, it wasn't necessary to file the, the lawsuit to to force the preservation of records unless we were actually going to destroy them. There is actually a retention policy that the Secretary of State has, which I, I believe uh, at, least a year, at least a year that the, the governor would have been required to retain those records. Um, I don't understand this Lilker case to be saying that the, the uh, reasonableness of uh, the, the delay is an affirmative defense. It has a, a CF site to another case that it characterizes as saying that. Well, I don't see it in the statute. Um, I, I agree. I mean, it's not the, the, the legislature could have provided that uh, and specify that that was an affirmative defense. But counsel for the appellee um, does correctly indicate that this is a, a constitutional mandatory duty of the highest order, and that's correct. So I'm going to flip the questions uh, with you and say, you know, how long can an agency delay a request? I mean, granted, in this case, I, I don't understand why the circuit court didn't even acknowledge the hurricane. I don't understand why that wasn't discussed in any way. I, certainly seems to me to be an extraordinary circumstance that devastated so many thousands of people's lives. But what is the responsibility of the agency in terms of funding uh, public records offices, in terms of ensuring that, as your opposing counsel stated, when these record demands are made, that they are very promptly uh, responded to? Um, yeah, thank you, Your Honor. There several aspects of that question, so if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll uh, proceed to, through, through them uh, one by one. Um, it is certainly the case that the Florida Constitution says that every person has the right to inspect or copy any public record, but the Constitution doesn't actually specify when or how that right is to be fulfilled. It leaves that question for the legislature to determine in the exercise of its enforcement authorities. Did I, thank you for that. Did I see a reference in the appellee's brief that that is self-executing? It is a self-executing provision, but there's just it simply doesn't specify the answer to this question. And the, the Florida legislature has done so in the Public Records Act, but it has done so in a manner that clearly indicates some flexibility through its use of the phrase that, that we, we would be obligated to respond at any reasonable time and in good faith. And another feature that we've already touched on that, that does also touch on the flexibility that necessarily must be afforded an agency is that they have to operate within the limits of their appropriation. They don't have infinite time and resources to respond to public records requests, uh, especially an agency like the executive office. Well, I take, the, I take Appley's argument to be contrary to your position. And I think Appley's argument is it's your responsibility, the agency's responsibility, to ensure an adequate appropriation, to ensure that public records requests are met in a very prompt manner. In other words, uh, your opposing counsel stated that you can't just say, well, we've had 100 requests that have been pending for a year. We just can't get to it. How do you respond to that? We, we certainly cannot just sit on our hands. That wouldn't constitute a good faith response. So, uh, I, and I understand from your brief, the office which the governor reinstated, actually had been eliminated, I guess, that there were two people in the office, is that correct? Correct. Now, it, if, if that proves inadequate to meeting public records requests, does your office have an obligation to request additional appropriations 
I, I, this is precisely where I think we are veering into potentially perilous separation of powers territory, where it is clear that the, the this Constitution actually says that the, the judiciary cannot fix appropriations. That is for the legislature. And furthermore, the, the recommending of legislation is a discretionary duty of the, the governor, which I do not understand also to be a judicially reviewable issue. Um, I, but the timeliness is. We do have the we timeliness do, is, right. but it has to, I think it inevitably has to take account of. We do have the authority to determine whether an agency responds in a timely what that means, what reasonableness means. In other words, um, I assume a court could decide that um, 20, 30, 50 days because of a lack of appropriations and personnel is not reasonable, right? If the, if, the circumstances the case, if the circumstances in the case justify such a determination, yes. So we, don't, we don't believe that would be the case here. And, and to your Honor's earlier question about how, you know, how much time would have been too much time, um, like opposing counsel suggested there is no bright line rule, that the statute clearly doesn't set a, 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 a firm time limit there. It uses uh, flexible language. Well, we I'm would sorry. agree I, there's a line. I'm pencil. sorry I've eaten up a lot of your time, but I'm going to have to ask you to conclude because I did the same for okay, your opposing no, counsel. <laughs> That's fine. Your Honor. We, we, we would just uh, conclude by, by saying that the, the circuit court here erred in multiple respects. First, in not uh, in ignoring the evidence of the circumstances that EOG face in effect and not, in, in not requiring the plaintiff to make a prima facie case here. It effectively shifted the burden. All right. If you go much further, I'm going to have to give opposing counsel a serve rebuttal. So thank you. <laughs> thank thank you, you for your arguments. Thank you. And the second case we have is uh, Weiser or Weiser versus Florida Department of Health of Office of Medical Marijuana and other parties. Is the appellate ready to proceed? Actually, this is the motion to dismiss filed by appellee. I apologize. So I will ask the appellee to go first and explain why the motion should be granted. It's an unusual argument. Thank you. It certainly is, Your Honor, and I appreciate the clarification provided by the court. Uh, a, a while back. Uh, may it please the court, Jim McKee, on behalf of the appellee movements, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, uh, and I will also be sharing three minutes of my time with counsel for the Department of Health. Now, as, as counsel, or I'm sorry, as, as uh, your honor mentioned, we are here on a motion to dismiss filed by the appellee movements, um, seeking to have this case dismissed on mootness grounds. Now, specifically, the, the underlying action, which was an administrative uh, petition, challenged a decision by the Department of Health that approved a change of ownership, uh, basically a change in shareholders by a licensed medical marijuana entity uh, by the name of McCrory's. The action was filed in, a, in an attempt to prevent the closing of a transaction by the licensee's parent company, a recapitalization transaction. The thinking there being if, if the department's approval of this change in shareholders could be prevented, or if it could be delayed, then the, the broader recapitalization transaction could not occur. Petition was filed. Um, it was filed in, uh, in, well, the approval was sought in 2020, November of 2020. Uh, the department approved the change in shareholders in 2021. Um, Weiser subsequently challenged the approval, filed that administrative petition. The administrative law judge 
granted our motion to dismiss for lack of standing, determining that Weiser, the appellant here, did not have standing to actually raise his claims to, you know, to challenge the approval. And the department issued a final order, and this is obviously the, the important facts here. The department issued a final order May 4th of 2022, denying, uh, well, dismissing, essentially adopting the ALJ's determination that uh, Weiser did not have standing to challenge the approval. That final order also denied a motion to stay, which had been filed by Weiser prior to the entry of the final order. Now, importantly, Weiser did not seek a stay from this court, did not seek review from this court of the department's denial of its, of its stay motion, uh, and instead filed a notice of appeal June 2nd, 2022, so almost 30 days after the final order was issued. It took, Weiser took no steps in between to prevent the, the recapitalization transaction from occurring for, to, to prevent the shareholder change from occurring. Ianthus, which is the parent company of McCrory's, the, the licensed entity here, closed on the recapitalization transaction June 24th of 2022, so almost a year ago now. So the, the change in shareholders, the, the, the very change that- As I understand the appellant's argument in response to your motion, it appears to be that essentially this is such an important issue that the department acted improperly, now standing obviously is at issue, but that even though this transaction has been completed, the recapitalization, that the issue itself of when, re when uh, ownership is allowed, when uh, the opportunity to challenge whether the ownership involves multiple MTCs, medical treatment centers, Essentially that the issue is um, subject to, first off, that it's important and that it's subject to reoccurring. Am I misunderstanding the primary focus of the response? That, that is certainly the argument, and, and we disagree. Um, and, and you're right. I believe it was, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll probably state the wrong case name, but, but yes, there's, there is a case that basically lays out exceptions to mootness, um, and, and those are two of them. Um, we don't believe that this is a, essentially a question of great public importance that should be heard even if the case is moot. Um, but we're, it, here, we're here on a, on a motion to dismiss where essentially um, you have won as to standing, and now you are telling us, hey, we even have another justiciability argument that we'd like you to hear. Um, but the facts of it are, are disputed. Um, why should we dismiss now instead of going forward and if there are new facts? And uh, your 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 brother wins here and goes back. You can you can have it out in a in, in a in a place that can deal with disputed fact issues. Well, certainly, Your Honor. If if facts truly were disputed, if, if we were here with you know contentious facts that, that could not easily be uh, determined, then I would agree with you. I, I think there'd have to be some sort of an evidentiary hearing. Should that really happen on appeal? Probably not. I don't think there can be any reasonable dispute that the transaction has closed. The, the recapitalization transaction, it did close. Um, there, June 24, 2022, there was a, an SEC filing that said, hey, here's the new shareholders. You know, this transaction is closed. There's press releases uh, that were issued. Now, the, your opposing counsel makes the argument that several of your assertions in the motion are based uh, on facts outside the record such as citing a website regarding the recapitalization. And, Your Honor, I think that's consistent with, with this court's case law and case law of other courts considering mootness issues. Certainly there's a number of cases where uh, the court has determined, in fact, the, I would assert the, the, the entire doctrine of mootness on appeal, um, what you look at there is intervening issues, things that have changed since the final order was issued. So if we accept the argument that you can't dismiss a case as moot unless there's record evidence of why it's moot, you'd essentially be saying we can't dismiss cases as moot anymore. And, and that's certainly not what this court's done. It's not what the Florida Supreme Court has done. Um, I, I believe even the, the Canadian, there was Canadian litigation that was referenced in, in the response, in appellant's response. That Canadian litigation, uh, if, if I happen to pull up some of the documents, uh, some of the filings, it doesn't assert that the closing did not occur it's trying to unwind the closing, basically saying, sure, it, it, it closed, the transaction is closed. We're seeking to unwind the transaction that already occurred. So, so again, that's, that's why I say I'm not sure there can really be any dispute that the transaction has closed. I think the argument is the transaction shouldn't have closed. But it's a little more complicated than a suggestion of death. The appellant has died, and here's a death certificate, and 
basically it's an agreed deal, right? Certainly, yeah. certainly more complicated than that. But but I think the, the the case perhaps that I would I would point to the most is Montgomery versus Department of H, uh, HRS. I guess this is back before the uh, the, the name was changed. Um, but it described this is uh, this court back in 1985. It described mootness as the doctrine of standing set in a time frame. The requisite personal interest that must exist at the commencement of the litigation, standing, must continue throughout its existence, mootness. One of the issues that, that we looked at in determining that this case is, is likely moot is the harm that the appellant sought to, uh, to, to avoid was the issuance of shares which were going to dilute, to dilute his interest. Those shares have already been issued. So the, the idea, even, even if, let's say, you know, the department a year from now, two years from now, says we think that there's a, a dual ownership violation. We think there's a violation of this statute that says you can't have dual ownership. The remedy for that would be prospectively to say you've got to come into compliance. If there's any dual ownership issues, come into compliance. Not we're going to go back to a transaction that happened two or three years ago and somehow unring the bell. Let's try to put the toothpaste pack in the tube. If you've got an equity, if you've got to change an equity. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. Just <laughs> Do you think that the appellant should have moved for a stay in the agency or this court or either one? I, I believe they could have moved in either one. Okay. And, and there was a motion for stay that was filed prior to the final order being issued. Um, so that was that was denied. I, I think that was untimely, but it All was right. denied by the court. So if the agency or this court had, they, say they did exactly what you said they should have done, they should have moved for a stay, and it gets denied for whatever reason. I can't think of a good one off the top of my head, but it gets denied. Too bad for them, they got their motion for stay denied. That then gives you the right to come in and say, ah, without a stay, the appeal is moot, dismiss the appeal. Well, certainly they could have sought review from this court. So they, they could have gone here, I believe they could go directly on an, an administrative case, but certainly they could have sought review of the department's denial of a denial of a stay. To stay. Well, go ahead. If, well, if, if they choose not to do that, I, I would also point you to uh, Florida Rule of Appellate Procedure 9.190, uh, which pertains to stays in, in administrative cases. And it says, the filing of a notice of administrative appeal or a petition seeking review of administrative action shall not operate as a stay. Uh, and then he goes on to, to talk about some exceptions. The, the rules and, and the case law, I, I think, are very clear that there is a doctrine of administrative finality. Once a final order is issued, a party is entitled to rely on that final order. Certainly, there's also a right to appeal. But in the bid protest context, which you know we, we work in uh, quite a bit, there's a number of cases that say once a contract is issued as a result of, of, of a government procurement, even if you ultimately win on appeal, if a contract's already been signed, there's no effective remedy. There's maybe some ancillary relief. Maybe you can get your, your bid costs. But these courts, this, this court and other courts have not said just don't worry about it, just unwind the transaction, just you know, rescind the contract that's already been issued. I would submit that this is, this is similar to that. Um, I will turn it over to uh, my, my colleague, if that's all right for court. Good afternoon, Ed Lombard of Lombard Miles on behalf of the Department of Health. May it please the court. Um, I'll just start with uh, one of the questions that you asked, uh, Judge Osterhaus, and, and I think it, it, at least from the department's perspective, we agree it's moot. And here's, here's why. The allegation below of harm, right, which is what they would like you to remedy, was dilution. That dilution has occurred. So even if there was a violation of the statute that you alluded to, uh, Judge Thomas, and that was reversed, you know, if you guys reversed and we went back down, the dilution can't be undone. And even if there's a violation of the statute in terms of dual ownership by uh, one person, that could be remedied without undoing the dilution, meaning let's assume Mr. McKee is the, the owner who is in violation of that statute. He can transfer it to me who is not in violation. He's still diluted. Weiser would still be diluted. So the point here is what was the harm that would have to be, that they're looking to undo here, and it's dilution. But you can't. It's already happened. And so from but, our perspective. But isn't that, the, the, I mean, the problem for us is that, that your, your brother says that, well, there's some stuff going on in Canada, and, and there's reason for us to think that, Things aren't so set, and what do we do about it? What's our mechanism for dealing with the fact issue? And that's and that's a fair question. I, if they're disputing that it closed, that it that it didn't, they're saying it didn't close the transaction. Or everything we've seen indicates that it did. Then I, I agree with where everybody is, which is well. Then we've got a factual dispute as to whether it is or is not moot. 
But I, I don't think you're going to hear that it didn't close. What you're going to hear is, well, we're taking efforts in courts to unwind that transaction. Well, if it closed, it's moot because it's already been diluted. If it's unwound, then what's the harm? Because there's, it, a Canadian court wouldn't dilute them. I, I, it's unfortunate that for them that they didn't get a stay from this court or otherwise stop the transaction from occurring. But at the end of the day, we find ourselves with post-final order, post-judgment actions that have rendered the relief that they seek un unattainable at this point. So that's the department's position on this from a regulatory standpoint. It's happened. You know, we approved it. We can't unwind it ourselves. We don't have that authority. All we can tell somebody is, look, you're in violation of the statute, you know, come, come into compliance or else. So from our perspective, we would agree and we would ask the court uh, to dismiss. Good afternoon. Um, a please the court. I'm Steve Menton with the firm of Rutler Justini on behalf of the appellant, Michael Weiser. Um, I think the court's already identified the primary issues here on the motion to dismiss. I think the uh, Goodwin case that's cited in our response to the motion to dismiss is the controlling precedent that determines what this court should be looking at as it relates to the, to the mootness issues. There are three exceptions that are recognized within the Goodwin case, and I think this case falls squarely within all three of them. First is the collateral issues, uh, which Judge Oosterhaus, you were asking about earlier. Um, at the time that we filed our response to the motion to dismiss, we noted that there were pending proceedings in Canada that directly related to uh, the, the transaction that's at issue here. Prior to coming today to this court, I conferred with my client and with Canadian counsel again, and those issues are still pending in the Canadian courts. Um, so there, the, the, uh, the direction that I would receive from my client was to go forward with this appeal because they believe that the ultimate ruling on the substance of the issues raised in, in our proceeding are relevant to what could happen in Canada. So there are collateral implications of the proceeding that was brought that will continue on um, and, and that uh, resolution on the merits is warranted. In addition to that, the other two factors that are f uh, cited in the Goodwin case or whether or not it's a matter of great public importance. I think, Judge Thomas, you've already raised that. The, the regulation of medical marijuana is, is, is strict in Florida. There are specific prohibitions against dual ownership of MMTCs in this state. It's a very specific statutory provision. It's one that has not, we believe, been fully addressed based upon the record and the, uh, before the Department of Health, and that's what we sought to do through the proceeding that we initiated. We were seeking both to, to uh, ensure the clarity of, of what the statutory requirement was and also transparency to make sure that all the facts that are related to a very complicated transaction in a highly regulated industry are fully laid out and fully considered by the Department of Health, which we don't believe happened in this case. So it is a matter of great public importance in terms of of, of providing some clarity as to what that statutory provision means. And it's also a question that's likely to recur again in the future, which is the third component of the Goodwin test. There are, as, as I'm sure this court is aware, there's a growing number of MMTCs that are coming into the state. There's more licenses being issued. Exactly how those ownership provisions should be considered or how they should be considered in the context of the dual ownership prohibition which is Florida's statutory requirement, is something that is likely to recur and is one that should get clarity uh, in terms of its interpretation. Now, is it? Go ahead, Judge Walker. Thank you. Uh, you've indicated that um, you meet all three exceptions to uh, the mootness doctrine uh, to, to keep us with jurisdiction in this case. By doing so, can I presume that you do agree that the appeal is moot and that the only way that we can not grant the motion and dismiss this appeal as if we apply an exception to mootness? I, I don't agree that the appeal is moot because I, I think that it, it, I think it kind of overlaps with the, co the collateral issue. It has implications, you know, in terms of what goes on in Canada. So the decision that was made by the Department of Health was affirming the ALJ's dismissal of our petition for lack of standing. There was never a full airing of the facts, you know, in our, in our view, um, that uh, 
related to the underlying transaction. So this has been dismissed on a technical ground. We don't think that the, the full factual basis has been fully put forth to the Department of Health or to this court. And is your uh, uh, choice not to move to uh, stay enforcement of the order? Does that not make any difference? We, we moved to stay at, at the Department of Health mm -hmm. level. We did file a, a motion to stay as part of the exceptions that we've submitted, and, and that was denied. So we, we did seek a stay. I mean, the client made the decision, at, you know, I, I think as part of the evaluation process not to seek a stay here. They didn't think the likelihood was, was, was going to be um, was great given the ruling that the Department of Health had made. So what do you say then to the department's argument that essentially the harm you seek to address is the dilution of your client's ownership. And that's already occurred. And even if it's unwound in Canada, then the harm will disappear. Well, I, I think there's two answers to that. One is that if the, if the transaction is actually unwound in Canada, I think that the implications or ramifications of that are unknown. It's beyond my level <laughs> to, to understand what would happen in Canada. But if it as were unwound in Canada, would that not mean that, and I, I may be misreading this, would that not mean then there would not, could not be a statutory violation? There couldn't be dual ownership. I'm, I'm not sure I'm following your question, Judge. All right, I was wrong. Um, but but to, to, to your early question, um, I, I think that um, the, the issue also is going to, because it's going to come up again, it's still worthy of, of resolution both by this court and by the Department of Health. You mean the generic question of dual ownership? Yes. And what that means? Right. So even putting aside the mootness of what would happen in Canada uh, on the collateral issue, I think the, the issue of great public importance, the clarity as to what the dual ownership prohibition means, is one that should be resolved by this court. And, of course, we don't get to resolve it on this appeal anyway because it, it just goes to standing. If, we, if you prevailed, it's referred back to the department. Right. So that we can develop a full factual record and bring forth, you know, the issues that we tried to bring forth earlier. Um, I know that the court's already been here and heard arguments over the time limit before, so unless you have any other questions, I'll save you the time and, and sit down. And we appreciate your consideration and would ask that you uh, deny the motion to dismiss. Thank you. And I've just got a, a few points. Uh, first, I, I think what you, what you heard is not not an assertion that the transaction has not closed, but that tra the transaction could be reopened theoretically if they prevail on their claims in Canada. Whether or not there actually is a legal, legal avenue to do that or not in Canada, I, I don't know. Um, <coughs> but the transaction has closed, as I, as I mentioned earlier. With respect to the mootness exceptions that were cited, again, uh, this is not a, great, a question of great public importance. First, I think, importantly, uh, Judge Thomas, as you mentioned, the only issue that would actually be adjudicated in this appeal is standing. It's, it's standing and whether or not Weiser had standing to raise his claims at the administrative court. The issue in this case is not how to interpret the dual ownership prohibition uh, in, in Florida's medical marijuana statute. Um, the department reviewed, with respect to that question, uh, the department reviewed in detail the, the filings here, um, the, the shareholders and whether or not there was a dual ownership violation and determined that there was no stat statutory violation. Um, certainly that's a legal issue that, that uh, individuals who practice in marijuana law might be interested in, but it's a relatively arcane legal issue, not one that's, that's truly of great public importance. Um, I would also submit that it is not capable of repetition yet evading review, which is typically the, the exception to mootness. Certainly it can be adjudicated at a later time if necessary. Uh, essentially, it would be an advisory opinion. Any, any decision by this court on the dual ownership prohibition would, would I would submit, be a, an advisory opinion. Um, that's all I have, Your Honor, so unless there's other questions, I'll uh, ask that this court dismiss uh, for mootness. Thank you both for your arguments. Thank you. Court is in recess. All rise.